Good morning. How is everybody doing on this Friday morning? Hopefully you are looking forward to a wonderful weekend. Even though we're in lockdown, there's lots of good fun stuff to do. Um, the weather is still being reasonable for January, so at least I can get out with my dogs every day and spend some time enjoying nature. <laughs> Anyways, as I go through this live, feel free to ask questions in the comments. I will answer throughout the live, so just ask away. If you are listening to the recording, let me know by using hashtag replay in the comments section. And please feel free to ask anything as you watch the play playback, as I will regularly check back to, to answer questions. Um, feel free to say hello, tell me where you're from, tell me something about your dog, uh, and I'll get started. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Paula Hoger. My company is Shake a Paw Dog Training, and I opened its doors in September of 1998 course in the past 23 years um, my training has changed dramatically I was always a positive trainer but how to do that has changed and improved dramatically over the last however many years that is as I continue to search for the best methods to not just train the dogs but train the humans because to be honest I am not a dog trainer I am a human trainer you are the dog trainer you are the ones that lives with your dog every day I don't. And it's all the bits. It's all the little bits that happen every day that give you that well-behaved dog you're looking for. And that means that while I guide you in your journey, only you can decide what guidelines your dog needs to understand for your life together to be harmonious. This is your life and your dog. You get to orchestrate what that will look like. Not the person you hire to help you solve the problems. Not even me. Uh, not some random person who has had dogs their whole lives, who is constantly nitpicking at every little thing. Don't you love that? Um, and certainly not some random social media dog trainer who likes to preach, even though they have no idea who you are or anything about your dog. Never forget this. Um, I'm going to take a moment and say hello to everybody who said hello. Good morning, Clancy. I thank you for being here. Good morning, Carrie from Winchester. So local. Uh, good morning, Patty. How is that lovely puppy of yours doing this morning? I was speaking to someone the other day and they were telling me how they would like their dog to have better door manners. And this goes back to what do you really want? So I asked why? Because on the rare occasion that my non-dog family comes to visit, my dogs, my dogs jump all over them is what they answered. To be honest, my dogs have horrible door manners. And this is because I honestly just can't be bothered to train good door manners. It's not I can't. I totally know how I would do it. I teach clients to do it all the time. I just can't be bothered. When I have company coming who are not going to appreciate the enthusiasm my dogs may greet them with at the door, I either put my dogs in their crates or behind a baby gate, both of which my dogs do very well. See, to me, that is a priority and that I work on. Meaning when I put them away, they will settle down and take a nap. All training takes time and effort. Everybody who's ever trained anything knows that. With everything you train, you have to decide if this is the best use of your time. Most of my company enjoys the enthusiastic greeting and actually encourages it. Do you have company like that, that cranks your dogs right up? When you think about the guidelines you want with your dog, you really have to think about why. Is it because someone else has this guideline? Is it because somewhere you heard or read that this is what a well-behaved dog sh should behave like? Ask yourself, do I really actually truly want this? Do I need this? How does this make my life with my dog better? Um, let's take jumping. I remember my dogs are pretty well trained. Uh, I'm very proud of their training. They can go anywhere. They compete in sports. In my opinion, they're pretty well trained. And I <laughs> was talking to someone and my Iggy, who's now 11 years old, jumped on someone and Iggy jumps politely. There's some dogs that when they jump, they power. Iggy kind of comes up on his back legs and hugs and it's cute and I've allowed it. And we're, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Anyways, it was like a 12 year old boy and he's like, <laughs> Iggy jumped on him to say good morning. And he looked at him with disdain and was like, oh, my dog is so better trained than that. He doesn't jump and I'm like, no, he's not. He just doesn't jump. So this is where you just got to think about what you want. Good morning, Julie. How are you? When do you get your puppy? 
Good morning, Debbie from Western Massachusetts. How is the weather there? Good morning, Barb. You must be so excited. The puppy countdown is very close. Okay, so let's so back to jumping. I like most people think I would like my dogs not to jump. Um, but my dogs jump. Why? Because I don't want them to stop jumping as much as I think I want them to stop jumping. Or at least I don't want it all the time. That means sometimes I allow them to jump, which reinforces the behavior of jumping, which as we all know ensures the jumping behavior will never go away. And I'm not saying your dog shouldn't jump or should jump. I'm just saying if you let, if you love coming home and your dogs jump on you and you love that moment every day when you come home, that's perfectly fine. You've just got to understand that your dog is going to do it to everyone. Now, funny enough, I personally don't love the jumping and my dogs don't really jump on me. But especially with Wicca, my 11 month old puppy, she is the first dog I've raised with my husband in my child home because of COVID pretty well all the time. And my husband's never allowed jumping, but you give him a little girly who he loves and all of a sudden she jumps on him every day and he's allowing it. And I'm like, meh, I could bitch at my husband all the time, be on him and try to fix it. Or I could just go, let it go. Um, okay, so, but when I reflect on the jumping behavior, that behavior isn't one I'm willing to put the work into. Because every time I commit to doing the work, something happens and then I say, okay, you can jump on that one person. Like when someone is petting Iggy and he oh so politely hugs them. Everyone is happy, the person enjoys the love, and of course, Iggy loves the attention. And I allow it. Because it turns out in my life, jumping has proved to be a useful behavior in some situations. So that means I have to accept that not jumping isn't a priority for life with my dogs. And that is okay. The flip side of that is I just have to be prepared when my dogs, that my dogs are going to jump and not yell at them and get mad about it. Just be prepared. I can deal with it. I have to let go that they're not going to jump, but I can, as soon as I put them on leash, they won't. I can control that beautifully, right? So I have other skills that help me manage the jumping. Um, you have to let it go. And I get that. I still have a hard time with Wicca. She was off leash the other day and I had in with some clients and before lockdown and um, she jumped, she came out and said hello and jumped on them like she does to everybody else. And I didn't say anything to her, but in the back of my head, I said, I, I, I did make excuses to my clients about her jumping and you know who it is. They might not even have noticed, but I felt their perception of me as a dog trainer was diminished because my dog was jumping on them. Perception and the stories we tell ourselves in their head, they rule the world. In hindsight, I could have asked if they were okay with it. At the time, they seemed perfectly fine. And if they hadn't been okay with it, I could have put Wick on leash and problem solved. And then I had to let it go. So repeat after me, let it go. If you decide you want some behaviors and that doesn't have to be jumping, it can be getting on the furniture, not getting on the furniture. Um, you just got to figure out what, what you want out of your dog and not train the dog for when you have company once a year. Um, so let it go. I have discovered life is a whole lot better when you just learn to let stuff go instead of constantly obsessing over things that you aren't or can't change and spend all that mental, mental energy on what you can and are willing to change. And that is really important in dog training and really in life. Okay, let's go back to the comments. Jill, good morning from Vancouver. Julie, poodle, poodles jump, poodles jump a lot. There are definitely breeds that are more jumpy than others. Uh, 16 months, she is jumping less. Good for you, Julie, keep working on that dog. Um, Jill, do you have poodle jumping also? Debbie, 40 and sunny today, warm spell. Oh, that's lovely. Yes, that's lovely. Don't worry. At least we have so snow now. Before it was just gray. Today it's gray with snow, which is at least prettier than gray with no snow. Okay, so back to the subject for today. What does socializing your dog mean? I want you to, so if you have a brand new puppy, um, this is going to be exactly what you need. But even if you have an older dog, all these things that I do with a puppy, you can still do with an older dog. And I'll talk about that right at the end. I want you to look into the future. Actually close your eyes and really imagine 
what you want the future for you and your dog to look like. What are you doing with your dog? Do you like to explore? Are you picturing you and your dog going for walks, checking out new trails, new streets, new sites, new locations? Are you an outdoor enthusiast? Do you plan to go hiking and camping? Of course, you'd want your dog to join you, right? What about your family? Will your dog be hanging out with you and the kids? What does that look like? What do your kids like to do? Jump on the trampoline, run around the yard, play with Lego in the living room. What's your dog doing when your kids are playing? Does your dog, sorry, does your child play sports? Will your dog be calmly hanging out on the sidelines as you watch your oldest score the winning goal in the weekend soccer game? What about family gatherings? Barbecues, holiday parties, events, going to the cottage. Is your dog by your side a welcome addition, well-behaved, well-mannered, invited anywhere your family goes? The dog everyone comments on how well-behaved he is. Do you have a picture of the future in your mind? Good. This foreseeing helps you figure out what, your, what skills your dog will require to be the dog you want. Remember what I just talked about at the beginning about everything takes effort? My dogs may jump, but socializing to me is super important because all those things are described are things my dogs are expected to do. And what I do now as a puppy will give me or bring me a whole lot closer to that dog as an adult. So not quite sure what this looks like yet. No worries. Here's mine. I always picture my dogs walking through Chinatown in Toronto, and I have done this with a dog, so I know what it feels like. When I picture the future with my dog, I picture every little detail of being there. Have you ever been in Chinatown in Toronto or any city? It's crazy busy. People, people of different ages, builds, clothing, colors, um, crowded people everywhere. The foot traffic on the sidewalk, the cross tra traffic of people coming in and out of stores, kids running by, bicycle couriers zooming by only a few feet away, and the smells, the smoke ducks hanging in the windows, all the veggie boxes out in the street, the dim sum restaurants with their wonderful delicacies, the fish truck pulling up for deliveries, and the noises. It is so noisy, it's chaotic. People singing, people shouting in different languages, buses, car horns, police sirens, street cars going by, and you know they squeal when they stop. Chinatown in Toronto is chaotic to say the least. I picture that future because I want it with all my dogs. I figure if my dog can do that, my dog can go anywhere. I don't have to worry, oh, I don't know how he's gonna behave here because my dog can go anywhere. Now that you've got that picture in your mind, um, the next question you have to ask yourself is, how do I start? By socializing, this is what I mean by socializing. Like I said in the introduction to this, socializing is not taking them to the neighbor's house and playing with their dog. That's great, I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm just saying socializing is this huge endeavor and people say, oh, I went to puppy class. I'm good, I've socialized my dog. And that's so not true. In fact, puppy class, I years ago, I stopped doing puppy classes because unless it's a perfect group of dogs, what they're learning is not what I want. So when I allow my dogs, my puppies to play with other dogs, I want them to learn how to play politely. So that means there is no humping. I won't let them be a bully and I will not let them be bullied. In a puppy class, I find there was always a dog who hid under the chairs and there was an always a dog who was kind of a bully. And ideally they would be removed from play, but because everybody comes to the puppy class and everybody pays to play, I couldn't do that. And I didn't like what some of the dogs were learning. So find dogs for your dog to play with, but be prepared to end the play if your dog doesn't play the way you want them to. Because as an adult, that means you can let them go play with anybody and you can call them off and they can be polite, whatever your rules are for polite. But otherwise, you're stuck in a situation where I've been at the off-leash park and people are like, oh, your dog has to learn how to get beaten up. No, no, no. That doesn't create, that doesn't build confidence. Remember, you're always building confidence. My dog getting the crap kicked out of him is not building confidence. In fact, it could build fear and lead to aggression. Okay, so back to socializing. Um, 
So real socializing, because that's what socializing is. Acclimating your puppy to the sights, the smells, the sounds, the feels, the emotions. It's exposing your puppy to everything that will make up that picture in your head of your future together. The first week I have a puppy at home, I spend time socializing to home. Everything is new to the puppy. Some breeders are awesome and have already had their puppies out in the world and some have not. Regardless, they are still super young and everything, every single sight, sound, and smell is still new. My goal is that every experience work towards building confidence. For example, with Wicca, um, there was a tarp covering some firewood and one day it was blowing in the wind. I, those are, I love those things because those are my opportunity to expose the dog to some fear and help the dog understand how to get over the fear. I gave her the, I gave her the opportunity to investigate at her own speed and reinforced every step of the way. So that, that means She's standing there, she's looking at this flappy thing. And if she steps towards it, I may throw a cookie in front of her. I may run away having a party. I may just be like, wow, what a really good girl. But it's that step forward that I'm building. It's that confidence to overcome fears. Um, I don't expect my puppies to be fearless. I am building recovery, the ability to be scared and overcome their fear. They overcome their fear by building curiosity and by investigating. We had already been around the tarp for a few days, so she was comfortable in the area. We had already had value for following me. So when I saw she was worried about the moving tarp, we started by hanging out far enough away that she would look at it, but didn't feel the need to run away. It was just like, hey, look at that. A little cautious, but I don't need to skedaddle. We played games, did a little recall work, so a little name game, called her name, gave her cookies, had a little fun. After a few minutes, I stepped a little bit closer, just a step or two. Again, letting her make the choice to join me. I did not call her closer because I don't want to put her in the situation where she has to choose whether to come to me or not because she's too worried. I don't want to put my dog into that conflict. I just stepped a little closer and saw if she would come. Luckily, it ended up being windy for a few days. So by the end of it, we were playing hide and seek around the moving tarp, which is awesome. Okay. Um, let me go back to comments. Debbie, good job. Debbie says, took both pups individually to sit in the parking lot for socializing. Debbie, that is awesome. That is exactly what you want to do. Carrie, I have a golden doodle mastiff and he's a jumper. And how big do they expect the gold, golden doodle mastiff? I'm just trying, Carrie, you're going to have to post a picture. I just can't even imagine what that looks like. Is he curly? Is he smooth? Is he, what color is he? Anyways, um, how big is he? How old is he? Uh, yeah, definitely can't be a jumper. So all I said about jumping, keep in mind, my dogs are 30 pounds and 50 pounds. When I had 90 pound Akitas, there was no jumping, absolutely zero jumping at any time. So always a balance, right? What I expect, what I will accept from a 90 pound dog is not what I'll accept from my little 30 pound Wicca. Okay, back to my notes. Puppies are curious and dependent. Creating a dog that is open to overcoming fears but doesn't wanna leave home. As a wild dog, this allows the dog to investigate and get comfortable with their immediate sur environment surroundings keeping them safe and close to home. And this is why I talk to people all the time and they're like, oh, my puppy comes beautifully. My puppy never leaves. My puppy stays in the yard. This is why. That starts to change around four months old. This is when the socializing window starts to close. The dog will then go from less curious to more fearful. But the dependency also starts to diminish around more closer to five months, getting the dog ready for sexual maturity. Now, if they were wild dogs, they would head out on their own. But to keep them safe, they become uber paranoid and super cautious. Keep them leery as they explore new worlds. Better reserved with fear than curious and dead. Makes sense, right? This all works for what, well for wild dogs. But the question is, how do you use this knowledge to help you create that confident adult dog? And of course, we can never forget 
the effect of your dog's individual temperament and breed tendencies. Some dogs are friendly, some dogs are shy, some dogs are indifferent. Some dogs can be people friendly, but new environment worried. Some dogs are noise sensitive. The first step is to take advantage of the socializing window to expose your dog to the world. I want to point out, once your dog is comfortable in the new location or experience, it is no longer socializing. I challenge you to make a point of changing it up regularly. Be creative. Ian Dunbar, the father of positive dog training, said your dog should see 50 people a week from when you get them to when they are four months old. That does not mean they need to touch or even get super close just to see them. Helping them understand that people come in all shapes and sizes, that people are safe and good things happen when strangers are around. Even if you have a super friendly, never met a stranger puppy, you should still do this. Even that super friendly puppy will hit fear periods as they hit adolescence. The more variety of people they've seen, the more likely they will be comfortable with everybody and still picture them all as people. Not all of a sudden think men in sunglasses and hats are ax murderers. And then you get that stranger danger where they see something and they're like, oh my God, that's what you want to avoid. But um, when your dogs hit fear periods in adolescence, you're still going to get some of that. So the more work you've done as a puppy under four months old, the easier that will be. Carrie, he's black with a little white on him and he's about 180 pounds. Wow. He's a year old right now. Yes, 180 pounds cannot jump in any way, shape or form because he could hurt people. So that would be a big deal. Um, okay, so this is where a lot of people go wrong. Socializing is not just letting your puppy go places and do whatever he wants. Because you're not just socializing, you're also starting to set the habits that will be the behavior of your future dog. You also have to manage the environment so that they learn how to behave around people, how to still be able to listen to you and walk while on leash. I do this by playing the ODR game. If you're new to my world, first of all, welcome. Second, here's a quick recap of the ODR game. ODR stands for Observe, Don't React. This is a game I created to teach dogs how to watch anything while staying under control. Because really, the problem isn't your dog watching the squirrel. The problem is your dog losing control when he watches the squirrel. And possibly, and that losing control looks like lunging and barking and screaming. The ODR game is an important piece of training that creates that great adult dog. Once your puppies understand the concept of how to watch calmly, real world distractions become easier to deal with. And I am doing this every minute with my puppies. Um, being aware of when they want something that they're exhibiting the behavior that I want. For puppies, of course, we have a few baby friendly modifications to the game. I don't walk my puppies. I, working on leash is very, I teach them how to walk on leash. I don't put them on leash and go for a walk. I believe asking a puppy to go for a walk and to try to deal with a new environment is asking way too much. Walking on its own is a hard enough skill to master. Now you're throwing in adding the mental load of the new environment. The goal is not to overwhelm one piece of new criteria at a time. I usually start in a quiet corner with only mild distractions. So my favorite place to go one of my favorite places to go, especially when I have to be indoors, is Canadian Tire. I usually, with a puppy, I might put them in my coat and I go, this is the middle of winter, so I walk over to the gardening section. So there's stuff going on in the store, but our immediate surroundings are quiet. Then I put the puppy down and I might walk him depending on how he's doing, but I might carry him, depends how old he is too. Then I put the puppy down and, okay, can you handle this? Um, a lot of puppies, um, so let me go back to my notes or I'll forget part of what I needed to say. The goal is not to overwhelm one piece of new criteria at a time. I usually start in a quiet corner, only mild distractions. Let the god dog guide you where to go and what to expose them to. Remember, not overwhelming is the goal here, building confidence. The easiest way to accomplish this is to go places and stand. Just stand, just be there. This allows me to observe the puppy and the puppy to get used to, to acclimatize to their environment. 
Are they worried? Are they excited? Are they overwhelmed? A lot of puppies freeze and that's fine. They're just like, um, I love watching them slowly acclimatize to the new environment, start to move around. Yeah, usually takes a couple of minutes with a lot of puppies and they just, and then after a few minutes of nothing happening, they start to sniff and then they start to move. And then you're like, there it comes, the brain is arriving. But I can't imagine if you were walking a puppy and now he's freezing and you're pulling on his leash, how he never gets a chance to overcome this. And then you're in a new this, and then you're in a new this, and then you're in a new this. And that's when I think you get the balking on the leash, the biting at you, all that stuff happens because they just never get a chance to get comfortable in their new surroundings. Um, okay, let me finish this bit and then I'll go to the comments. I see some comments. Um, before I put them in this position, I have already taught them that leash pressure means move towards me. So remember, I've had them about a week usually before I do this game. This is done by putting pressure on the leash and rewarding them when they move into the pressure. This way they don't panic when they feel leash pressure in a new environment. Um, some puppies absolutely lose their minds when they feel leash pressure for the first time. A, I do not want to do that anywhere where the dog is not a hundred percent comfortable so that now you're again two criteria right he's flipping out because there's leash pressure and he's in a new place already worried i don't want to do that so the leash pressure game is done in my kitchen in my living room in my front yard somewhere the dog's totally like okay i'm good i can deal with this um now once we've gotten there and the dog starts to move around now we're playing odr with puppies this is super easy because they don't know how to pull. They feel pressure, they back off right away. Basically, I just stand there with my leash hand anchored to my body. So when the puppy goes to the end of the leash, they don't get reinforced for pulling because they don't go anywhere. And they will avoid the discomfort of the collar and back away, which is exactly what you're looking for. Again, before I do this with my puppy, I've already started to build a relationship. My puppy knows who I am, knows good things happen with me playing foundation games like teaching them their name and having their collar grabbed. With a few within a few minutes, the puppy starts to get even more comfortable in their environment and will start to go, hey, look at you out there. This is the sweet spot. This is where your dog is learning how to relinquish the environment and be ready to listen to you. This is the first step of your dog listening to you no matter what is going on around them. All right, comments. Julie, we did the list of new people, sounds, etc. And she's very social and super friendly. Went to downtown Ottawa. Now she wants to see and be involved with everything. Builds confidence. Good job, Julie. Oh, I can't wait to see her. Or see him. Oh, are you still talking? This is still talking about um, Sisu, not your new one. Debbie, seeing other dogs out the front window is the only place ODR isn't quite concurred yet. Debbie, you know what? ODR, training a puppy is, um, is, is a journey. <laughs> it's definitely a journey. Good for you for continuing to work on it. It will come. Just keep going. Yeah, this is how it works. Yeah, this is how it works. Yeah, this is how it works. There's piles of stuff that I look at Wicca and I'm like, you are going to get better with this, right? <laughs> and I know she will because like I said, in last week's live, that experience of knowing it will work makes such a big difference. Okay, Julie, that is Sisu. February 25th, oh, not long now. You'll have to post a picture as soon as you get them. Okay, please hear me very carefully say the next line. I do not want you to feed them when they look back at you. So you're standing there, you're doing ODR, the dog looks at you. What I want you, what everybody does and what I want you not to do is, you're so good, here's a cookie. Feeding for not doing anything can easily lead to behaviors you don't want, like jumping at you or barking at you for food, or that they don't know what to do. They look at you, you give them a cookie, then they look back, then they look at you and you give them a cookie and you get this anxiety because sooner or later you wanna stop feeding them for looking at you, but then they don't know how to behave because you haven't given them tools. Instead, I want you to ask for super simple behavior that you know your puppy can perform, such as call their name and reward motion towards you. Remember, before I am doing this, I have already started playing the game at home where the puppy is comfortable. I will post the link to the video of me doing this with Wicca when she's like, I don't know, 11 weeks old. 
her name game at that time, we were having all sorts of problems. So if you watch the video, when I'm doing name game, I say her name and then I put the cookie in her nose and lure her to me because I was pretty sure she wasn't ready to actually move towards me on her own. And when I'm doing this, I want super simple, high rate of reinforcement behaviors. So I'm not putting more pressure on the dog. I'm just going, hey, look, you can come when I call you when there's when we're standing in Wicca's case, when we're standing next to the supermarket with people and carts going by, which is what I want. I am not teaching my dog to stare at me in public, just to be able to listen to me in public and not all the time, just when I ask. I want my dogs to be comfortable in public, to look around, to go, hey, what's that? I want them to be able to do that. I don't love the training theories that are like, just get your dog to stare at you all the time. But sooner or later, your dog has to look away. That dog can't be comfortable if he's staring at you all the time because he has he's aware of all that's going on around him. And to me, that would cause more stress. This is not sustainable, the staring at you. Sooner or later, your dog is going to look away from you. And then they will not have the skill set to deal with the environment. The confident adult dog I'm creating is capable of looking around and staying calm. That's my goal. The adult dog understands how to work with me regardless of distraction. And that's my other goal. So that is how the how. Let's talk about the what. Especially in the time of lockdown. With all the people still, a oh, lots of new puppies coming home. I start with working on that 50 people a week. To get what we to get that, we need a predictable flow of people. Supermarkets, liquor stores, beer stores, box stores all have a steady flow of people going in and out. Currently in our area, the outdoor skating rinks and toboggan hills are very busy. Um, great opportunity to expose your puppy to a bunch of children running and screaming, which is tough for a lot of dogs. The good thing about COVID is people are not as likely to come over and try to pet your puppy. I love that because with a friendly puppy, I want them to learn that not everyone is going to say hello. And with a shy puppy, I don't want them to be overwhelmed. And people sometimes have a real hard time when you're like, no, you can't touch my puppy. Um, I have a client who's worked really hard. She has a 10 month old dog or 11 month old who's mildly people reactive. And she's had a very hard time and he's very cute and he's very big. And she's worked very hard at being able to tell people, no, I'm sorry, you cannot pet my dog. And in the last, right before COVID, we had this conversation. And in the last two weeks before that, she says three times she has told people, don't touch the dog. He's not comfortable with it. And three times the people ignored her and went ahead and touched their dog. And one of these people actually stuck her hand, his hand into her car window, which is, this is like a 90 pound dog. What was he thinking? But she's done such a good job with this big boy that he didn't react any of those times. But still, it's really hard. People ignore you. You're like, don't touch the dog. And people are like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Here, let me pet your dog. So protect your dog, walk away, do that. Carrie, that's what Maverick does. He barks when he wants a treat. Yes, and it's so hard. He stares and he barks because that's what worked, right? They look at you, you give them a cookie. They look at you, you give them a cookie. They look at you, they don't get the cookie. They're like, hello, and they give you a bark. And then you're like, oh, maybe I should have given you a cookie. And then you give them a cookie. And now you created the, when you want me to pay attention, when you want a cookie, bark at me. So what I would recommend you start to do is if he barks, turn around and walk away. Even on leash, he's still coming with you, but just, oh, you bark, bye-bye. And I turn and walk away. And then I reconnect. And he barks, bye-bye. And you can say bye-bye or you can not say bye-bye. It's just, I talk, so I say bye-bye. Um, and you keep doing that till all of a sudden he's going to be like, this is not working. When he finally is quiet, you do not reward him, but you do uh, ask him for a sit, ask him for a down, um, ask him for a come, anything like that. Okay, Debbie, the staring at the pocket. Um, four dogs back now. <laughs> I had a Siberian Husky who would poke my pocket and drove me nuts. Couldn't fix it either. And finally I figured out why. We do this, we call our dogs, they come, we reach into our pocket and reward them. So what they are doing when we pull out the cookie is staring at our pocket. And that's how the pocket 
problem starts. So what I do to solve that is if I have to reach into my pocket for more treats, I don't reward them with a cookie. I put the treats in my hand, in my other hand, and I pet my dog and say, what a good boy. So I try never to pair pulling out of my pocket or pouch or treat bag or anything like that with actually putting the cookie in my dog's mouth. I usually have a pile of cookies in my hand if I'm training and they are delivered from my hand. The reason for my hand is okay because when I have cookies in my hand, my hand is sitting closer to me, but sitting like this. They know there's cookies there. I'm fine with that. But it means I can put my hands into my pocket and it's fine. And I really, I don't sit like this unless I'm about to give them a cookie. So it doesn't become, I stare at your pocket long enough, you will eventually feed me. Or somebody else, like I remember the Off Leash Park, if you stuck your hand in your pocket, you'd have five dogs attached to you going, are you going to give me a cookie? So that's, there's a sequence of events there that you're rewarding the pocket. And if you stop, you can still fix it. Okay, back to our uh, socializing puppies. Keep the session short, super, super short. They're babies. You don't want to overwhelm them. 10 minutes max gives your puppy a chance to be exposed. Especially in the winter, you don't want this experience to turn sour because your puppy is cold. With tiny or naked puppies, put them in your coat. They still get to see everything while staying warm. Do not let people pet them while they are in your coat or while you're holding them. For a worried dog, they have no room to escape if they need to. And this is why you often see small dogs that growl in people's arms. Uh, what I suggest, even with the tiny dogs, if somebody wants to pet them and you feel your dog wants to be petted, I put the dog on the ground because most people are not going to get into their face while they're on the ground because that would require a lot more bending than most people are willing to do. So on the ground, they don't tend to get overwhelmed. We're in your face. They're like, oh, puppy, puppy. And they're right in your dog's face. And your dog may be like, yeah, I really don't like that. Next is noises and sights. Hang out near a garage. The air compressor noise can easily startle a dog. School bells, the air brakes on a truck or bus, car horns, stand near traffic. Go through a drive through A lot of dogs freak out when somebody sticks their head towards your car. So going through a drive through just gets your dog comfortable with, this is something that happens. People stick their head in my, in my owner's car. Go to a full serve gas station. Christmas decorations. I'm sure somebody still has their Christmas decorations up or find, um, you know, those blow up people that they have like at gas stations that flap in the wind. Oh, those would be perfect. Um, you get the idea. Be creative. Get out with your puppies and show them the world. Don't think, oh, I've walked down the street. My dog is socialized. Even something simple like every day or every couple of days, change where you go for a walk, get in the car, drive a block and walk there. Every house is different. Every house smells different. Every street is different. Just keep changing it up. I can't say this enough. But remember, the goal here is not to overwhelm the dog. If I'm socially, social, oh, the car wash, Julie. Yes, the car wash. Never quite know what's going to happen in a car wash. Um, If I am socializing an adult dog, I go about it the exact same way. Let your dog guide you what you can expose them to. For example, Wicca came home last spring. Every week, me and a friend who also had a young puppy would try new and different outings. It became our Sunday outing. I soon realized the planning of the outing was very important to the success with Wicca. There are all subtle signs. They... They were all subtle signs, but once they happened a few times, they were telling me this isn't just a one-off. This is a problem that I have to pay attention to. We would always stop, stop for breakfast or for lunch or to get an ice cream on our travels. We found every outdoor patio that allowed dogs in the city. This helped the puppies work online quietly while we had our treat and watch people come and go. With Wicca, if we did this on the way out, she had a much harder time dealing with the rest of the outing. She wasn't able to work on simple commands or walk calmly on leash, frustrating me and her. If we did our outing and then went somewhere just to hang out, Wicca did fine. Even then, we had to shorten our outings to get the best results. This, just show, this was showing me that just hanging out used a lot of brain cells for my little princess. And then asking for her to deal with the world was too much. We don't realize how exhausting it can be for our puppies to be exposed to the world. 
or even something like a family gathering. They are babies and need frequent rest to recover and be at full power. And if they're not at full power, they will probably misbehave and overreact. Anyone who has had kids knows how a toddler that hasn't had enough sleep can act as compared to one that has. Puppies are the same way. There's so much work on to work on with a puppy. It's sometimes hard to make sure they're getting enough rest. Sometimes forcing it by putting them in a crate gives them enough and then giving them enough time to just be dogs. Um, I had, I rescued an Akita many, many years ago and we went to a dog show and she would get out of the crate. She would go to the bathroom and we were there for two days. That's it. That's all she would do. Um, she wouldn't, she would not go anywhere near the dog show. So we hung out near the car and we put her in her out of the crate. And it was cool because we went back every year for like three years. And it was amazing watching her improve every year till by the third year, she would walk through the dog show. No problem. Didn't have a care in the world. Okay, let's go back to um, comments. Tanya, drive through is health for us. Yes. Um, yes, drive throughs can be. If your dog isn't comfortable with the drive through that person sticking their head in your car is a big deal. But I imagine with COVID, they're doing that. They're not leaning in as much as they used to. But yeah, so um, you could, as you get to a drive through throw a frozen Kong in the back and they could chew on their Kong. Um, my Akitas years ago used to ride loose in my van and they would sit between the seats. And, you know, Tim Hortons used to give us free Timbits for the dogs, right? You'd walk up, if there was a dog in your car, they'd give you a plain Timbit. Except my Akita tried to go help himself to the Timbit. So he was sitting between the seats and he stood on my lap and leaned in. Of course, the poor woman in the drive-thru had no idea how friendly he was and he was. And when the big head came out, she was freaking out. So be careful with that. Monica, what should I do if he doesn't want to walk? Monica, are you talking about a puppy? If he doesn't want to walk, are you trying to walk him away from your house? So one thing I haven't mentioned, puppies want to stay close to home. Most people put their dogs on leash and try to walk them away from home, but the dog doesn't want to go. So you end up screwing up your leash walking because they don't want to go. By five months, they'll have no problem leaving home. I don't walk my dog away from home. I put him in the car and I go places because I'm always socializing, walking as training. So most of my walking training I do in my driveway. So let me know if it's a puppy and you're trying to walk him away from home. Debbie, I have to go out of my neighborhood in the car because I'm working on car rides. Oh, dogs that get sick in the car, it sucks. Um, I wish I could give you some great advice, but there isn't any. There's a bunch of stuff to try. There's a gravel that's non-drowsy, that's ginger-based that you can try. Um, don't feed them. My one good news is most dogs, I don't think there's ever been a dog who didn't outgrow it by the time he was a year old. Uh, meanwhile, what I did, I've had two dogs that did this. I carried a lot of clean towels in my car. So with my Akita, he used to ride in the back of my car before the van. And we had multiple layers of blankets in the back seat. So if he threw up, we just um, collected them, put them in a garbage bag, and there was a dry layer underneath. Uh, with my Chesapeake, I had just bedding for the crate. And if she threw up, I cleaned it up, put the bedding in the crate. Yeah, I wish I could give you some great news with that. Uh, the vets do have stuff you can use on long car rides, but it's um, the last time I looked, it was super expensive and not something you're going to do on every car trip. Uh, one thing I did work on, though, Debbie, was getting my dog comfortable with going in the car because dogs who get sick in the car start predicting they're going to get sick and then won't go in the car. I would every night before dinner, I would take my dog in a frozen Kong and throw him in the back seat with his Kong and read my book. So he got into the habit of wonderful things happen when we go in the back seat of the car. And that really helped him getting in the car. Didn't help with the nausea, unfortunately. Carrie, parking lots are horrible. Carrie, you're going to have to explain what that means. Does that mean your dog is barking at everything in parking lots? Um, 
Is your dog in a crate? That would be where I'd start with that. In a crate covered with a blanket. So when you are ready to train, you can uncover the dog and work on behaving appropriately. Patty, a challenge is having a dog secured in crate when in the car. They don't see much when driving or stopped unless you take them out. Ollie gets final shots today, looking forward to a bit more freedom where we can go with feet on the ground. Um, yeah, but you can stop places and open the crate even without taking him, open the door so he can see the world, even without taking him out of the crate. And I'm going to talk about vaccines in just one minute. Um, Monica, away from the house. Yeah, stop trying to walk him away from the house. Practice your walking in the driveway when you want to go away from the house, put him in the car, drive him away. You're fighting something that is just, he's got that need to stay in the house. And I really like that. So I don't want to argue with it. Carrie, yes, Carrie. Okay. Carrie, you're going to have to tell me why. Oh, parking lots are horrible. Yes. Um, if he's in a crate, come room with a blanket. So that, if you go back a few Facebook lives, how to stop a problem, how to change a problem, how to fix a problem, the first step, stop it from happening. So definitely in my car, he would be in a crate covered with a blanket where he can't see anything and therefore shouldn't bark at anything. Then I would be working ODR game outside of the crate because you have a lot more control and getting him comfortable and not barking. Um, I would leave him covered in a crate until he could do it in public, not in a crate, and then I'd start working on the crate. It's hard in the crate because you can't move away, you can't cover them. Anyways, message me about that if you want more information on how I'd go about that. Okay, I want to make a comment on concerns with parvo and distemper. These are the two diseases your puppies may not have immunity from and that can be very dangerous. First, I stay and remember, I am not a vet. I am telling you what I do. Only you can decide what is best for you and your dog. First, I stay away from heavy dog traffic areas. For example, pet stores or off-leash parks. And um, I carry my puppy into the vet until they have at least some vaccinations. Because if there is a sick dog, they will be at the vet. <laughs> so, yeah. I would strongly recommend to contact your vet and see what the parvo and distemper rates are in your area. That way you have an idea how big a concern this is and how much you have to be careful. If it is high, I would be super careful where you put your puppy down. Uh, one client used a wagon so her dog could stay off the ground and they also make strollers for dogs these days. That being said, you can bring parvo into your home on your shoes. So I'm careful where I go when I have a young puppy. Like I don't go anywhere near off leash parks when I have a young puppy in my house. Uh, you can easily clean your shoes, but I just figure that's the easiest way. Um, well, there it is, guys. What socializing, what I feel socializing really is. I hope you watch this live a few times. Really take to heart everything I've said today. Proper socializing is the difference between a confident adult dog that can join you out and about or a worried, nervous dog that you never know how is going to react to the world. The dog ends up being left at home because it's just too hard to take him out. Nobody wants that. Everybody, most people want a dog that can go places and do places. I love working with people with new puppies and they're like, oh, but our last dog never went because we just, he barked or he pulled or he this. And I'm like, but now you have the opportunity to create the puppy that can go camping, can go to the trailer, can go on the boat. Um, yeah. Do you have an adult dog that may have missed out on this early socializing? Don't panic, all is not lost. Even though the socializing window starts to close at four months, that doesn't mean you can't socialize an adult dog. It does mean it will take longer. You may be dealing with lack of experiences, which is actually the best case scenario, but you may also be dealing with learned behaviors such as reacting to people. Before you can truly start to socialize, you will have to deal with any bad habits or behaviors so that the socializing can go, can make a difference. If your dog's triggered by people to react, you are never gonna make them comfortable with people. You need to deal with that trigger first. Now I talked about triggers a few weeks ago, but you need to deal with that trigger first before you can start working on getting comfortable with people. Uh, the other hard part with adult dogs is they're often a lot bigger than puppies. So harder to control if they don't have leash manners. And of course, there are expectations with older dogs. 
when you get a puppy, you expect them to know nothing, hopefully. We still have expectations, but that's a whole other life. When you get an adult dog, you expect them to have certain skills or behaviors. I've had many clients who have put their adult rescues into situations that could end up being disastrous. For example, um, I had a client, they rescued a nine month old dog from the Humane Society. And they had a huge family gathering with like 30 people at their house three days after. And he was loose running around with the kids. And of course, then eventually snapped at someone. And that's why they called me. That was a huge expectation for that dog and so overwhelming. The consequences can be dire in some situations. So please don't take any risks. All right, a couple of announcements before I sign off. This week is the last weekly live I will be doing. Sad, I know, but it's time for me to go all in on curating my dog training community called the Canine Reset. Moving forward, I will be hosting lives just like this, one today, once a month. The lives will be held the first Friday of every month at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Inside the Canine Reset community, I go live bi-weekly for both Q&As and deep dive topics. Some are done over Facebook Live and some are done on Zoom so I can meet face-to-face -face with everyone. The great thing about our new community is this will provide me with tons of new inspiration for my amazing members for me to write all these lives about. The monthly free live topics will be chosen based on the challenges, triumphs, and adventures that the members are going through. My hope is that these will make the lives more relevant and engaging for you. Of course, if you don't want to miss out, you can always join the Canine Reset yourself. We've got an audit level membership where you can get access to the growing library of how-to training videos, watch the deep dive lives, and ask questions that may be featured in our weekly Q&As for only $50 a month. And of course, we have our custom dog training plan level where you get access to everything. You get all your questions answered, get custom dog training video videos made for you. Plus, and this is the biggie, members at this level get monthly consultations with me where we will design a custom 30-day plan based on exactly what you and your dog need to succeed. So you focus on what truly matters to your life with your dog. Let me know if you want to enroll or need some more information. Just send me a message here or an email at info at dogtraining.ca. I hope to see you on the inside. For now, happy training, and we'll see you in a few weeks. Bye, guys. Let me know if you have any questions. I will hang around for another 10 minutes watching the comments. Bye, guys. Have a great weekend.